Welcome, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us in the first four minutes. We had a few technical difficulties, but we are up and we are live. Hello and welcome to Luncheon with the Experts, a new carcinoid cancer foundation program brought to you by Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett and I am a filmmaker and writer and I have been working with CCF for almost a decade now. I can't believe it. And I help them, you know, use videos to educate and spread awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. And so if you've been following us for about the past year, we've been doing Facebook lives uh, monthly about different topics and have had such a great response that we were able to continue in a new iteration, a new version of the Facebook live series, which is going to happen weekly and it is called Luncheon with the Experts. It's gonna be a little bit different, but it's still a Facebook Live event with a one-on-one -on -one session. Sometimes I'm gonna have multiple guests, uh, some leading expert, but it's not always doctors. It might be patients and support group leaders and various people. Um, so we welcome you to the first episode. And if you are just signing on, please let us know where you are in the world. We'd love to see how far our reach goes. Uh, again, before we get started, I just want to say thank you, uh, CCS Facebook Live Series, Luncheon with the Experts would not be possible without the support of Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. We also have a quick disclaimer, uh, the opinions expressed by the guest presenter, as well as the questions asked by the audience have not been created or suggested beforehand by the sponsors, and CCF does not endorse nor promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in this presentation. So audience members that you all at home should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their, their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health and treatment. So that just means we are going to do our best to, to, to help guide you today give you the inf information, but by all means, speak with your own team about any decisions you make regarding your health moving forward. So today I am honored to host uh, for our first guest, Dr. Irvin Modlin, the creator of the NET test. How are you, Dr. Modlin? Good, and it's a great pleasure for me to appear on your show. I'm privileged to be your first guest. I hope that isn't an ominous thing. No, no, no pressure at all. I'm sure. I'm sure you'll be able to, to handle uh, to handle being the first guest and set all the expectations for the remaining 47 weeks that we're going to do this series. Can you um, tell us a little bit about? Uh, we're going to get deep into the net test and how it applies and how it may help uh, members of the net community. But can you give us a little bit of a background where you come from, how you ended up in this world of neuroendocrine cancer? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, my story is uh, a long and uh, variegated one. Um, I come from a little town on the edge of the Great Karoo Desert in Africa. If you get a sense of the size, you'll understand. Um, my telephone number in my home was two digits. Um, <laughs> so I've moved a little bit since then. Um, my original exposure to neuroendocrine disease was uh, going to London in 1975 and spending two years with um, uh, Tony Pierce, who developed the APUD system, mm -hmm. Steve Bloom, who developed the whole concept of neuroendocrine tumor disease, and Julia Polak, who was the original histopathologist who characterized neuroendocrine tumor disease. Um, spent a few years there, and then went to UCLA and spent um, two years uh, acquiring uh, material for a PhD in the physiology of uh, secretory systems, uh, which are neuroendocrine regulated in the stomach. Then to Brooklyn, New York, um, where I set up my first uh, laboratory and department. Um, and then subsequently, the rest of my career at Yale University, running um, the Department of Surgery and the Gastrointestinal Pathobiology Research Group, which was mostly stomach and neuroendocrine related. And now, um, in recent years, I've spent uh, the last five, seven years developing uh, the NET test, uh, a genomic test to identify different kinds of, uh, well, in this case, neuroendocrine tumors, but also other cancers in blood. That's a very, very rapid and I apologize, hubristic story. <laughs> uh, no apologies necessary. So 
For those that are joining us, to, to reiterate and remind you, this is the first of a years long, at least, maybe more, uh, a year long series that we're doing, Luncheon with the Experts. And so if you have joined us in our previous Facebook Lives, it's going to be a little bit different. The, the, the flow of the program is going to be a little different. Previously, we've done very straightforward Q&A sessions, right? Ask me anything. We, we were topic-based, and we got a lot of questions beforehand from the audience and, and during the Facebook Live. And so while, while if you have a question that comes up from the content that we discussed today, I urge you to ask that. But mostly what we're going to do differently in this series is more of a deep dive with the individual or individuals that we host and, and what they have done and how they have affected and impacted the net community. So for instance, today with the creator of the net test, we're really gonna talk about what that is, how it applies, how, how we can seek it out, how it compares to other tests and, and, and all the, the details about it and how it may help us as the net community move forward. So ask your questions if you have them, just know that we aren't going to be able to get to as many questions as we typically have. And so I want to remind you all that if we don't get to your question, please follow up with the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on their Facebook page, you can send them a message, or at carcinoid.org, their website. And also, this video will live here on the Facebook page, as well as the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel, if any people that you know that would benefit from this program aren't on Facebook. So... Um, that's basically it for our new series. We have one last thing before we get started. We know how challenging it is to, to be a net patient or a person seeking diagnosis, especially during the pandemic. And, and we want you to know that CCF is here for you when, whenever, however you need us. And if you'd like to show support to CCF and our work, please text experts, the word experts, to 1-914-380-7324. Seven three two three. Again, that's text experts to nine one four three eight zero seventy three twenty three, and we will include that in the comments so you don't have to just uh, always go back to this part of the video. And I am also going to right now add some resources that Dr. Monlin sent us to the comments. Uh, we have it. We turned it into a page on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation website. So I'm going to add that to the comments and pin it to the top. One moment. Okay, let me mute that. There is, I wish you all could see uh, what's going on behind the scenes here. So Grace, I'm going to just add that comment with the URL. And if you could pin it to the top for me, that would be great. Um, but yeah, everyone at home, there is a, quite an operation going on here. And I also want to apologize for my completely barren walls. Okay, I just added that comment. My completely barren walls who, that don't compare at all to Dr. Modlin's background right now. Uh, I just, for those that know me, I just moved uh, a couple of days ago. So everything's in boxes and there's nothing pretty on the, the, the wall behind me. So you'll just have to to deal with my, my handsome face, and I'm sorry for that. Dr. Modlin's got all his books and, and uh, trinkets behind him, and I just have nothing but white walls. So that should set us up. That juxtaposition should set us up nicely. Um, so, Dr. Modlin, I come from a storytelling background, um, and so for me, when I think about the journey that, that we may go on, I always like to start with the problem that we're trying to solve right? The conflict, the obstacle. So uh, I want to learn a little bit more about the impetus of creating the net test. And specifically, my question is, what was the problem that we were trying to solve? What, what was the gap that needed to be filled that led to this effort? I had spent um, almost 30 or 40 years uh, operating on uh, the gastrointestinal tract, pancreas, liver, small bowel, etc., cetera, um, mostly uh, tumors. And uh, most of this work took place uh, at Yale University. And uh, what had occurred to me was that despite all the great surgery that was being done by my colleagues and myself, invariably, six to eight months later, we'd have a patient back in the clinic with what was called disease recurrence. Mm. 
and sometimes even longer, uh, two years later. And it seemed to me that th there was a, a question that had just somehow blindsided everybody. When you take out a tumor, which is standard practice for neuroendocrine tumor disease, you know you've taken it out, but you have no idea what you've left behind because the only tools we have in the operating room are our fingers and our eyes. And uh, the ability of an eye or a finger to pick up microscopic cell residuals just doesn't exist. Um, you might say, well, uh, Professor, what about the pathologist tell you everything's out? The point is the pathologist can only look at what he sent. So the pathologist is actually reconfirming that what you've taken out is a tumor and how much you've taken out and what it looks like, you know, whether it's good or bad or dangerous. But nobody knows what's left behind. And then people were forced to just uh, go along and everybody gets told, look, we, we, we've taken everything out. I'm almost sure we've taken everything out. Of course, you'd want to say that to somebody and you really believe it. But that wasn't the case. Mm. Um, and so I then decided that I would take some of my um, scientific background and work out how we could demonstrate if a tumor had been left behind or if tumor cells were left behind. And the way best to do that in the past had been imagery. But imagery is very hard to interpret after an operation. And imagery is really quite insensitive. Um, the best it can pick up is certainly for CAT scan, MRI, three millimeters, five millimeters. That's millions, 50, 60 millions of cells. Mm. Uh, and that's a really a dangerous tumor load to leave behind. So what we did was work out if we could find evidence of the tumor in the blood. And the way to do that is to look at what's inside those tumor cells. Uh, and you might say, well, you pick up all sorts of stuff if you do that. But um, we spent years screening out uh, a series of about 54, 51 genes that are specific to neuroendocrine tumors. So when you pick those genes up in the blood, and we use a technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, extraordinarily sensitive uh, way of identifying genes, which some people refer to as transcriptomic material in the blood, um, you really were able to identify the equivalent of the contents of one cell in about 10 milliliters of blood. That's about 100,000 times more sensitive than any image. And the, all you need for that is the laboratory facility and um, about a milliliter of blood. Um, we've now refined it so you can just do it with a finger prick. Um, you might say, well, this is all about net tests and neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, well, I was very interested in that. I had a long background uh, in the field. But in fact, we've developed that now for prostate, colon, lung, uh, breast, and uh, myeloma even. Uh, so the whole thing is called in the layman's press, uh, liquid biopsy. And this is the great advantage. Um, you can just take a finger prick of blood and you can, within 24 hours, uh, understand if there's a tumor present in that person's uh, blood. And of course, the imagery will show you um, where it is, if it's big enough. If it isn't big enough, you're way ahead of the imagery knowing that the person still has cancer. So instead of waiting six months to a year after cancer surgery uh, to know if you, and everybody's worried, do I have it, how it is, it, you know, now, now you could tell, you can tell within 24 hours if there's a problem. Um, and that, that's the basis of about seven or eight years of work that I've, I've just nutshelled for you. Um, you can ask more details if, if it's helpful, but just, I think you phrased it very nicely, Rain. So what was the question? The question was, how do you find something that's present, but there's no other tool to find it's present? Mm -hmm. And you must know it's present because how can you treat something unless you know it's present? Mm -hmm. And the more of it that's present, the greater the obstacle to the treatment being successful because tumor burden is the biggest obstacle to successful treatment. So... That in a, in, a, in a rather more of a nutshell than you wanted, I'm afraid, is, is how I got into doing this.
So uh, tell me about the journey. Like, I know this has been available since 2014, 15, is that correct? Yes, we, we, we started earlier, um, you know, with the science. Um, you know, the so first step becomes uh, what you do in a hard science lab with transcriptomics and genomics. And then you turn it into practical application uh, in tissues and patients. And then you have to see if it has clinical utility. In other words, it always looks great when you do it in a lab at Yale sure. uh, or Stanford or wherever you are. Uh, but does it work for uh, diverse people in different populations, cities and countries all over the world? And that takes a couple of years to, to take care. And that's that's really what we've been doing the last few years. And And so... Since it was available, is it being widely accepted? Well, that's a difficult question. Um, if you stratify the population um, as into slow adopters and rapid adopters, mm -hmm. uh, which often translates into people who have serious background knowledge of something and people who don't have, you find that amongst the cognoscenti or the people who understand these things. So to, to, to grab this, you really have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to have a background in molecular genomics, mm -hmm. a background in oncology, and a very serious background in uh, deep learning machine uh, techniques or artificial intelligence. So obviously, uh, there's a very limited group of people who can appreciate all those things. Um, so it's taken a, a while to get people to understand them. But, but as that kind of knowledge has become wider and wider spread in other fields, apart from just neuroendocrine tumor uh, disease, um, there's, there's really a, a much more substantial acceptance. So then you need to also have acceptance by the, um, the doctors who are seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And very many of them have no exposure to molecular genomics. It's, it, it's something that is, is much more recent. And even fewer physicians have exposure to artificial learning um, mm -hmm. uh, techniques and such like. So um, a lot of people, you know, just say, I don't understand it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very realistic position. Uh, and then you have another group of people who, who adopt very rapidly, which is um, the the patient who suddenly says, well, I've got information which now makes me better understand how I'm doing. So when you ask me what's the adoption, it's a spectrum like everything. I mean, look at the yeah. adoption of steam engines in the UK uh, yeah. at uh, 150 years ago. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people who said it's going to poison the country. All the people are going to die. The machines are going to go off the tracks, etc." cetera. Um, the horse population of England went down 96% in a decade. Once the steam engine uh, and the railway engine became, but it's a, adoption is a is a tough thing. So, um, about a week ago, as we were leading up to this episode, we we you know put up put out some promotional material, letting people know that you were going to be the first guest, and people are very excited about it. I see that our numbers are are pretty high right now. The people in attendance at uh, you know live with us at the moment, and there was one of them that actually said, uh, because this sounds like a no brainer to me. And I don't know that much about it, but it seems like it would be an, e an easy sell, although you, you have a fair point about the adoption of almost anything. But someone said, uh, they said this has been, you know, some of us has take, have taken a net test and found it very helpful. What can we do to help the test become more widely accepted? Are there things, I mean, besides us having programs like this where we help explain it, are there things that people out there could, could, could do to help, help it become widely accepted besides just spreading the word? Yeah, I think that that's a that's a very thoughtful and uh, generous question. Um, like most things in life, uh, I, I don't believe in telling people what they should do, uh, and I don't believe in telling people how they should do it. I think if you if you want to know if something is helpful or useful, uh, expose yourself to it, and then decide for yourself if the information, uh, in some way or other, provides you added value to or added comfort to whatever you're involved in. So. You know, it's like anything. I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, about, you know, that, that I'm reading all the time. There's a new food, new dish being generated by a new Vogue chef. Mm -hmm. well, you can talk about it forever. But if you really want to know if it's going to be something you like, you have to go taste it. You may never go back to that place again or never eat that food again. On the other hand, you may say, God, this is unbelievable. I'm going to stay with this. So, so if I were a patient and I wanted to 
to use the test? Or, uh, where, where do I start? What's the what's the process? The um, the process is is really very straightforward. There's a website. I think I've provided it in information I gave to Grace. And Grace, uh, thank you very much for being so um, helpful in uh, allowing this process to move forward so smoothly and giving us some visibility. Um, the uh, the the website is set up specifically for uh, with portals for patients, portals for physicians, and portals for let's say academics. Um, you sign on, you put your name in, you you fill in a couple of lines, and um, I would imagine within uh, something between one and two hours, somebody will get back to you and uh, help you get a net test. The current strategy is we we simply overnight FedEx people uh, the the uh, system and they go to a local blood, blood drawing apparatus uh, uh, area or to their local physician. Um, we're developing uh, and well underway at the moment uh, machines which uh, will do this in the local doctor's office. So you just go to the doctor's office uh, and uh, the, the machinery will, will push out the answer in about two hours um, and it'll have an app on it which will be on your phone, which will get your, your results straight away. But right at this time, um, the, the average patient who wants to know simply has to hit the website and within 24 to 36 hours, given the exigencies of the transport system in the COVID world, something will be on your doorstep. And from when we get it back, which is again FedEx overnight, um, we will return the information. Uh, standard within three, four days, but it, it can be provided overnight if necessary. It's an eight hour procedure to fully genomically analyze somebody's neuroendocrine tumor to, in their blood. That's amazing. So no matter where someone is, they can get their, their blood drawn locally and then just send off the test. Yes. Um, nothing more than that required. And uh, that's great. The, the system that's currently under development, just because I'm sure the the viewers would like to know, well, what do we expect? Uh, is a finger prick device where you'll just prick it yourself, your finger, it's an automated device. Uh, the blood is collected, goes into a special vial. You seal it, put it back in the envelope and you send it out the, you know, 10 minutes later. You won't even have to go see a doctor. Doesn't even hurt you, you, anymore, the little pricks that they do on your finger. It's, you barely so notice it, right? Specially, specially devi- designed uh, uh, so you don't, no, really, I, I, I also sort of, I had a bit of a sneer on my face when they told me it was painless uh, because my idea of no pain is to have a glass of scotch inside me. But um, but these new finger things, you know, the, the original ones were Hagedorn needles, which yeah. were designed in, um, in Sweden. I don't know, the Swedish have a very high tolerance for pain compared to us namby-pamby Americans, you know. Uh, but th- these things, you don't even know that you've taken your blood. That's amazing. That's amazing. So uh, I do have a few questions, some that have come in beforehand and some just to get us moving forward. Um, so it seems easy enough. It seems like it's very helpful. We're trying to help out, uh, help the adoption and help it become more widely accepted. So um, there are still probably some barriers to, uh, to entry for some people. So let's talk about how um, how it applies to insurance. Is it covered? Does Medicare cover it? What is, what are your knowledge about uh, how it's covered for insurance at the moment? Um, the process of getting uh, tests commercialized is complex in the United States. And we're, Indeed. we've been involved in that for a couple of years. Um, uh, f- from my point of view, it, it, it's not something that I spend a great deal of time with. I consider myself uh, a scientist physician. Um, but I'm sure it'll take place because um, the insurance at the moment covers a test called CGA, which has been uh, in place for about 25 years or so. Um, the head-to-head comparisons with CGA are demonstrated to be uh, virtually of zero clinical utility compared to that test. Um, wow. You might say I'm biased. Well, of course I'm biased. I mean, if you build a house, you think it's a good house. But uh, th- these represent information uh, generated by independent authorities in prestigious universities in different parts of America uh, and Europe, uh, many of them ENET centers of excellence. 
Um, I won't bother to enumerate them because it's all on the information I gave to uh, Grace and any any one of your um, viewers can look at it. But I, I leave you with the, the the bottom line comment on it. The, the man who invented uh, basically and put CGA on the map as as a general biomarker for neuroendocrine tumor disease is Professor Shell Erberg from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. He did all the definitive work and has been the definitive authority on the subject for decades. Um, recently, um, Professor Oberg did a meta-analysis of all the neuroendocrine net tests uh, data that had been uh, uh, published in peer-reviewed journals um, and demonstrated that the net test was far superior than CGA, uh, which basically provided information with the same equivalence as a flip of a coin. I remind you jocularly, if you flip a coin, at least the coin belongs to you afterwards. So, uh, but, but um, on a serious note, um, uh, Professor Oberg has stated publicly and has stated uh, in, in the press, uh, published data, um, that he considers the net test to be superior to CGA and that the net test should replace CGA. Now, it, it just takes time for the wheels of organizations and public mm -hmm. opinion to grind towards that. But when the when this authority in the field um, is prepared to make a statement like that, um, then I think people need to pay attention because people are quite right to say, well, you know, Professor modlin has got a vested interest in this, so he obviously prefers the food that comes out of his kitchen to others. But, you know, at this stage of my life, um, you know, to put it pers in, in serious perspective, I've, I've published 600 manuscripts and about 17 or 18 books. Um, it's not in my interest to bend information to suit my purposes. It's contrary to my ethos and it's inappropriate scientifically. So the data is what it is. So you're a man of, uh, of constitution then, I like that. Um, yeah. Just to just to clarify, though, CGA is chromogranin A. Is that correct? Yes, chromogranin A, which, which was a very good idea in the 1970s when it was first floated. And to be completely transparent, uh, I was uh, one of the great supporters and uh, have written substantial articles about. It. You see, chromogranin measures one secretory product of a cell. Now, when you have a neuroendocrine tumor. A secretory product is not what's going to alter the outcome of your disease. It may generate issues related to symptomatology. What outcome, what's the, alters the outcome is the genes uh, in the cells, so the transcriptome, which regulates how that cell grows, invades, and spreads. Mm. Okay. So CGA just measures a secretory protein. The net test measures 51 different genes which really describe what the cell is likely to do. Is it going to stay there? Is it going to grow faster? Is it going to spread somewhere else? Will it invade somewhere else? And what is it likely to do uh, if you treat it with, let's say, a good treatment is PRRT, peptide radioreceptor therapy. So the, the net test uh, is what's called a multi-analyte test. Uh, CGA is mono-analyte. Mm. If you think of it like airplanes, um, CGA is a Cessna. It's fine. It flies. Um, <laughs> uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, Boeing 747s here with all the extraordinary complexity and information available inside them if you go fly them to another city. Yeah, well, and if it, if the CGA test was created in the 70s, we're talking about 50 years. So I think it was time for Yes, for an I, it's a very it's a very valuable test um in tissue to see if a tumor may or may not be neuroendocrine. But even that's going to be invalidated because in tissue now the the strategies are becoming available to identify these genes, right? Problem about tissue, of course, you can only sample it once. But the disease grows for 8, 10, 15 years. 
Mm. So you've, you've got a picture. I mean, think of it like your garden. You, t- you take a picture the first day you plant a rose, and now you're wondering what's happened in your garden 14 years later, <laughs> and all you've got is a picture of that rose 15 years ago. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the net test, because you're taking blood, is a dynamic, ongoing iteration story of the patient's tumor journey uh, and what's happening to it with the therapy. So it's real time. Um, if I can expand that for, thought for a second. Please. Think, think of, think of a, a patient with a tumor. They are embarking, and the phraseology has been nicely said for a few years about on a long journey, and sometimes a very arduous journey. Now think if you were going on a long or arduous journey somewhere in whatever country you live. I can't think of anybody today who'd get in their car without a GPS. You'd want to know where you're going. You'd want to know what your progress is like and what's happening on the way. So almost nobody goes without a GPS. Now, what the net test really is, is a GPS Mm. of the patient's individual journey with their own tumor. I love that. And and that's what, to me, the little bit that I have uh, learned about it since... um, since we agreed to have you, have you on the show it, as you're alluding to now is that it helps us helps us paint this picture of where it may go moving forward. You know, you use the term, the story or the journey of this, of this disease, but uh, the net test helps us see the probability or the, the likely paths that it, this journey may go. Is that accurate to say? Absolutely. You just said it far more artfully than I did. I mean, what you're actually doing is you're letting a patient and his physician know what's on the road and what to expect, as opposed to you come around the corner and you suddenly find there's a block in the road, there's a stone there, or the bridge is down, right? Mm -hmm. This, you can tell well ahead what's going on. And not only that, if you need to make a detour somewhere, the net test in many instances can be used to suggest which is the correct detour that you need to make. By detour, I mean is what's the new therapy that you need? Or is the road you're on taking you to the edge of the cliff? Should you get off that road and find another Mm -hmm. road? And and, and that's what tests of this kind will make. And the next development of the net test that's currently published is instead of taking just the 50 genes or so, Each of those genes falls into a little family called an omic cluster. So take from transcriptome to omic, transcriptomic, omic, and it's a cluster. And five or six of those genes together give you a specific story about what's happening to that particular tumor. It's a huge error to consider that everybody who has a small bowel carcinoid is the same as everybody else has a small bowel carcinoid. Each of these tumors is completely different. And therefore, each of them has to have its own transcriptomic analysis in the same way that your fingerprint is different to your neighbor's fingerprint. Uh, And what we're doing now is taking this understanding of a tumor's individuality in as much as we understand the individuality of each patient and being able to totally characterize what's happening to that tumor with the treatment it's getting in that particular patient. Lovely. I love that. Um, for, you know, for those at home, uh, also, if you're just joining us, um, I see the numbers are still sustaining at a, at a high amount. We like to see that. Let us know where you are in the world. We'd love to see where our reach is. And I just want to reiterate that Dr. Modlin has been referring to the website and these links, these resources that he's sent us. And I wanted to make sure that you, that you knew that we put that link in the comments and we also pinned it to the top of the comments. And so when you're watching the Facebook live at home and you look to the right um, and scroll to the top of the comments, you'll be able to see that information that he sent. And uh, I see us getting some, some likes and hearts. So if, we are doing a good job. Just let us know by sending in a little emoji, a little thumbs up or heart. Let us know that we are doing our job well. Don't mind me. I'm just having a sip from my custom-made Luncheon with the Experts coffee mug. What he's That's... not telling you is it probably contains some single old scotch. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't tell my secrets. <laughs> so so one of the previous questions that we asked um, 
about uh, insurance, which we, we touched on briefly, came from one of our friends, uh, friends of the program, Pat Murphy, who we've done video work with before. And Pat and her husband, Chuck, will actually be guests on Lunch In with the Experts further down the road. But Pat had another question that said, has the net test been FDA approved? Uh, as we all know, that's one of the hurdles that must be jumped. A, a, a large number of tests are not FDA approved. Okay. Um, they're, they're simply approved by the individual state in which the lab is licensed to work, which is called clear certification. It's a federal government process. It's extremely exacting. I know it took us uh, uh, years to get it. Mm. Um, and so th these are tests done in laboratories. The, the net test is um, clear certified in a half a dozen states in America that, uh, that we uh, are involved in looking after patients. In, but since most of them get sent to Connecticut, we've really focused on the Connecticut license. Um, it's, it's also uh, because it was becoming problematic to, to ship the large volume of samples we were getting from Europe. Uh, so we set up a laboratory in London, um, and that's a, a laboratory certified according to British and European standards, uh, which uh, does the test there. So there's no there's no issue with certification at all. We get revisited very regularly by the federal authorities who run through all the data, check everything and make sure everything's right. And, and my God, if you want to spend a sleepless night, uh, you'll do so before they come because they take the place to pieces. Uh, it's, it's worse than an operating room inspection. So yeah, um, we haven't got to the FDA yet. Um, I'm sure we'll get there in due time. But as you've probably noticed from reading the uh, processes that are going on with COVID at the moment. Uh, the FDA is a difficult group, but it's fair to, I should say to you that um, uh, because a cancer cell is infinitely more difficult to analyze than a virus cell, it took us about three or four weeks to develop a COVID genomic test because we thought we'd just be helpful for the community. Mm -hmm. And the state of Connecticut licensed us uh, in, within three weeks uh, to, wow. to do COVID testing. So you know, we do COVID testing from all over America if people send us the samples. We have no, um, what's the right word? Uh, let me rephrase that. I mean, we'd like to help people who are ill, uh, whether, whether they have carcinoid or not. We just like to do our bit. So we turned over the lab uh, for a month just to developing a COVID test. Okay. Um, I'm sure if the, the FDA is currently yeah. evaluating the COVID test as well, um, it's just going to be fine because the data is exactly within the parameters that they've requested. So we'll get to the FDA in due time. We're a small group. We're more interested in science than regulatory bodies, frankly. Understood. Understood. Um, so Pat's husband, uh, Chuck, who also goes by the alias Murph, that's how he's probably most well known in the net community, had another question that he sent in a, a few days ago. So what do you see as the potential financial and medical benefits accruing from the use of net test as compared to other testing modalities? Well, I mean, that's a very perspicacious question. Um, the, 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 the testing modalities are the other uh, biomarkers that have been used. And these include uh, CGA we've spoken about, mm -hmm. and then very specific ones, gastrin, insulin, glucagon, VIP, and serotonin. Um, but these are very useful to help make a diagnosis. Uh, but again, they monoanalyte and they secretory. So they only have a limited value in telling you what's happening with that tumor. It, it really tells you, is the tumor working or not? It doesn't tell you much about how the tumor is behaving as a cancer. And that's the difference. Mm -hmm. difference. Um, CGA, I, I've spent some time on, and I think probably uh, everybody understands. I'm not here to, uh, as the Australians say, rubbish CGA. I'm simply here to say that um, in 1910 or 20, the Model T Ford was very good. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 2020, a Bentley is probably a better car. Um, so if you want to travel with your disease, I'd travel in a high-class vehicle that gives you the most comfort and insight. Um, the other modality is imaging to follow the disease. Um, imaging comprises, for practical purposes in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, anatomical 
and functional imaging. The anatomical are CAT scan and MRI, and the functional are gallium, Dota PET, and the FDG. Um, so these are very expensive modalities, um, require you to spend most of a day at a hospital, uh, certainly for the CT and the uh, Dota PETs and FDGs, you get a considerable amount of radiation. Nevertheless, they're very important because they tell you where the tumor is and they give you some sense of how it's growing or not. What is needed is to fuse the information from sophisticated genomic biomarkers like the NET test with the imaging. So instead of looking into a room that's only got one light in the corner, you're in a room where there are three or four different lights lighting up the whole room so everybody can understand, the room being the metaphor for your tumor. So I think um, the biomarkers in blood, NET test specifically, will um, greatly amplify imaging. In a lot of places, and in fact, in one um, uh, registry study that was performed, uh, what happened is that it became apparent there's so much concordance between the net test in blood and the image. In other words, they tell the same thing, that it was um, a clear advantage to not have to keep imaging people. If the net test showed stability, a low lumbar, there was no point in imaging because the imaging shouldn't show any difference and you could avoid the huge time, expense, travel, and irradiation. Um, so I, th I, think, I think it has two scenarios that you can look at for the future. One is uh, synergistic, added information to imaging, and mm -hmm. two, the likelihood that you won't have to use imaging as much. That's got a big cost-benefit ratio to it. Sure. Um... Murph had another question that I think this leads into nicely. Can, can the net test help identify the location of occult or microscopic tumors? Now that we no, have all the, 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 I, it's, it's a really tough question. And uh, thank you very much for that, Murph. I'll speak to you later about that one. But, um, but on a serious note, um, the, the, the location of a lesion um, as a primary is usually well known. I mean, in, in sophisticated centers, I would say that 95% of neuroendocrine tumors are identifiable as to their location. Um, if you then have residual disease, microscopic somewhere, um, the net test will identify it. In fact, we have uh, a bunch of patients where the, imagery is negative for years and the net test is positive. And then after two, three years, suddenly the image becomes positive and you see it's in the liver or in the lung. But I mean, I'm talking about a world that you, you have to put aside some of the dogma that we're stuck with. Um, I mean, a good example is you look at breast cancer. I mean, people would only treat breast cancer once they could feel a lump and take it out. Now, of course, with the advance of imagery and very sophisticated imagery, you see microscopic breast cancer and you can take it out by, by, by seeing where it is on that particular kind of image. Or alternatively, um, you treat it. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily, it, it's something we're stuck with. I mean, do I have to know that the tumor is in the left lobe of the lung or in the liver to treat it. No, as long as I know it's there, I'm happy to give the appropriate drug or agent that will treat that tumor. But a lot of people are still stuck with the old thing, I've got to know where the tumor is. Well, I know from, from just the, the general perspective, you'd like to know where your tumor is. But if you sit back and say, realistically, so does it really make a big difference if that microscopic deposit is in the lung or the liver? The answer is no. You're not going to operate on something like that, most likely. It's a, it's a huge, um, there's a very, very low uh, uh, dividend yield ratio for operating on microscopic disease, uh, for sure. So you had, you had mentioned earlier about uh, pivoting during the COVID crisis to, to provide testing um, for, you know, for potential COVID patients or people who may have contracted the virus. What else, what else is REN Laboratories working on besides the net test? I know, you, I know that you're working on several things, right? Yes. Um, the, we, we started with a net test simply because I'd been operating on neuroendocrine tumors and I, I was quite frustrated by the fact that uh, 
they come back. It's interesting, and I, I haven't said this yet, and I, I don't want to alarm anybody, but uh, um, when you go look at, and this is work, uh, a lot of it's been published now from uh, collaborators at different universities in Milan and London and Germany. Um, you find that when the surgeon tells you it's an R0 resection, in other words, everything is out, the surgeon says so, and the pathologist confirms that, um, there's a good 30 or 40% of those patients that within three weeks of disease, in other words, when, when the turbulence of the operation is dropped down, um, have offered an obvious still evidence of residual disease, okay? So obviously, uh, neuroendocrine tumor disease relatively rare. So I switched my attention um, to looking at what I considered was the current big issue, which is prostate. Um, again, uh, difficult organ to work with because of its location, um, difficult organ to treat, and nobody knows if things are getting better or not because imagery of it is quite tough as well. And uh, anybody who's old enough to be fearful of a prostatectomy knows how nerve-wracking that kind of scenario is. So we thought, let's, let's generate a test for the prostate. So we have a prostate test, which is 94% accurate compared to the PSA, which is PSA is the monoanalyte equivalent of CGA, which is about 48% uh, positive. And, uh, you know, with that in mind, uh, we imagine prostate uh, cancer will be followed the same way with some imagery superimposed support by biomarkers. I mean, for sure, those of you who know or read about it, or even, God forbid, have had it, uh, a multi-pronged prostate biopsy is not something you look forward to. It'd be much nicer to have a blood test that says to you, look, your prostate, uh, you have a prostate cancer, but it's like this, it's a nothing, or you've got a prostate cancer, it's way off the screen, now you need to have something really done. Or if you have it resected, you can tell somebody, look, your prostate cancer is cured, or it's not, uh, just simply by uh, a blood test. And the most interesting thing of this, just to tell the anecdote, is we got onto the prostate test because one of our patients who we really believed that had been cured of his neuroendocrine tumor disease, kept having uh, a, a slight elevation of his net test, which bothered us intensely. Mm. Uh, and then it turned out he had a prostate cancer and the, some of the prostate cancers transform into a neuroendocrine type of tumor. So we'd actually picked up the neuroendocrine tumor transformation of his prostate cancer. These are the ones that are very hard to treat. So we thought, well, we better get a proper prostate cancer signature uh, and not just pick up the rare neuroendocrine tumor component of the prostate. But for those of the patients who are male and interested, you, you'll be surprised to know that um, prostate cancer as it transforms, transforms into, in the bad, bad guys, transforms into a neuroendocrine tumor. So uh, your net test may help you as well. Wow. So, uh, Dr. Modlin, I see a couple of people in the comments that keep referring to the REN test. Uh, is that different than the net test? And if so, can we distinguish between the two? Yes, it's, um, you know, because we, we, we um, my colleague uh, who has helped develop this with me, Mark Kidd, we both originally started uh, or spent a long time at Yale. Mm -hmm. And when we moved, we had to distinguish ourselves from the fact that we weren't at Yale any longer. Mm -hmm. And we started this laboratory called REN. Um, and so it became known now as the REN test. And then slowly we've got back to sort of to uh, what our sort of advisors would like us to do, call it the NET test. Uh, okay, yeah. so that's just, that's the, that's the street name for it basically is the, the REN. Yes, and, it, and you know, ju just for those of uh, your, the audience who, who, who like to know just a little bit more, we call yeah. it REN because the first person who ever took blood from a human being was Sir Christopher Wren. Mm. who's much more famous for building the cathedral and being the Lucasian professor of mathematics, but he actually was a physician. And then, and then he lost his way completely and started doing silly things like building buildings and stuff like that. <laughs> but Wren was the first guy to take blood. So we thought a liquid biopsy from blood would be appropriately called Wren. And of course we had the humble hope that we might become as important as Wren was one day. I like it. I love the cheek. Like a cheek. Yeah, yeah. I always, you know, I always love the stories behind things like that. So, okay, so I figured they may, may, may have been referring to the same thing, but I had just seen that a lot. So, 
you know, this, this sounds great. And what we're trying to do is help amplify that and, and, and spread awareness. So, so it becomes more widely adopted, but what's, what's, what's next? What do you see coming down the future? I mean, I know this isn't something that you do last year and it's out this year and then, okay, our job's done. So where do you take it from here? What challenges are you facing in 2020 besides the obvious one that the world is burning and is completely upside down for everybody, but, but what's, what's the next step for you? So the, 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 the big issue is everybody, it's like the mantra, people talk about personalized medicine, but they don't have any tools to personalize the medicine. They right. talk about targeted therapy, um, but nobody can identify a target. Um, the only targeted therapy um, is that with the somatostatin analogs, and the somatostatin analogs target a group of receptors, the somatostatin receptors, obviously, which for the vast majority switch off secretion and control symptoms, right? But symptoms alter quality of life. Symptoms don't really result in the demise of a patient, okay? What results in the demise of a patient is the proliferation of the tumor, the invasion, and the metastasis. Mm -hmm. To stop that, you need treatment. And um, it's no use continually sort of uh, going into the mantra of targeted, targeted, target. You have to be able to tell if your treatment targets uh, that particular uh, area. And then you have to be able to predict if the treatment will be effective. Who wants to get a treatment because there's a theoretical target somewhere, but you don't know if that target exists in that particular person's tumor. In other words, the drug may work on one person, but not another. A good example is PRRT. Mm -hmm. About four years ago, Professor Bode joined our group from uh, the Distinguished Hospital, um, the uh, International Oncology Center in Milan, and spent a couple of years with us, and she developed the signatures the molecular signatures in blood which would predict if PRRT, peptide radioreceptor therapy, was effective or not. She didn't just do that alone. She did it with the three leaders in the field, in the world, um, Rotterdam, Bud Berka, and uh, Milan uh, as well, where she came from. Um, uh, these, these three centers had pioneered the introduction of peptide radioreceptor therapy in the world. And with them, what she did was develop a signature called the PPQ, um, Peptide Predictor Quotient. Okay. And what that does, if you do that test, which is exactly like the next test, you just need a blood sample, it tells you with 95% efficacy if PRRT will be effective. So... The next steps, I think, will be to tailor the molecular signature from a particular patient's tumor to mm -hmm. be able to identify that a therapy that their treating physician proposes will be effective or not. In the case of PRT, which you know costs about a quarter of a million dollars, um, you don't want to be giving somebody that kind of therapy if you don't know if it'll work. Um, and then if you give it, you'd like to know if it is working, and the net test because the net test monitors disease progress, will tell you if it's working or not. So you ask me for steps forward, I would say that individual, each person's individual tumor would need to, needs to be characterized. It's easy, just need a milliliter of blood. Um, and then from that will be developed the signature, which tells you which of the particular agents are claimed to be effective in neuroendocrine tumor disease will work for that patient or not. That would be the step forward. This business of uh, taking a therapy and then seeing if it works after six months. How are they seeing if it works? Using imagery. We've just talked about the fact that imagery is very insensitive. In fact, imagery in neuroendocrine tumors is of critical concern for even the image makers themselves. They know it's not too effective. Um, so we're giving a therapy. We don't know if it'll work. And we don't know how to watch and see if it'll work. It takes six months to a year before you can mm -hmm. tell. So if you've got a blood test that can be done at a minute's notice to give you that, and the blood test also predicted if the therapy would work or not, that would be the next step forward. I mean, that's seriously personalizing medicine. Mm, I love it. So before we go, uh, I'd like to spend at least a moment talking about the, the test results. So I know you basically get a score, but, but what is, you know, 
how how are the results read and also what do they mean so what does a lower score mean in terms of potential long-term outcomes like tell fill us in a little bit about that some of the people have taken the test out there but some of the people are hearing about it for the first time today yeah so the 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 information that you, you imagine measuring 51 things at the same time and that could change gives you information that you know for simple purposes 51 to the power 51 i mean you're talking about wow. uh, uh, as many stars as there are in the sky kind of thing so you have to have um very sophisticated uh, sophisticated computer learning algorithms to give you a number and that that number you can't give that to the average person you can't even give it to me uh it, it has to be transformed in a way that uh it makes sense to um a, a lay person or a patient or a physician none of them are mathematicians um so you transform it into a scale of zero to a hundred which the vast majority of people are very familiar with we can grasp. um <laughs> the the the, the score is then has been assessed on a hazard rate ratio basis and with mathematical probability indexes for the disease being stable or progressive. And um, that's applied into a nomogram, which gives you a risk probability of your disease being absent, present but stable, present but progressive, or uh, I, I hesitate to use the other term, but rampant okay mm -hmm. um and those scales are built in on on the number that you get um <clears throat> and tell you exactly where you are and what your probability is likely to be when you have a particular score um, it's dynamic remember if you take a particular drug let's say you have prrt um, and then you have the net test you started off with a level of let's say 60 uh, active progressive tumor and after three or four cycles of net test uh see your cycles of prt you're down to 30 or 40 uh you've got very good information to know that the therapy is working and that you're uh, on the good part of the road that we're talking about with the gps so that's the scoring system i think we'll probably make it um more sophisticated in time but at the beginning you know there aren't many multi-genomic tests available to the public we thought we had to keep it at the limit where it would make sense to people because you know think of it you get a new tv and you want to set it up if it starts taking you 45 minutes to set it up i mean you're crazy you walk away so you have to have something that people can switch the button and get a picture and says oh my disease is under control mm. yes this tv analogy this uh sounds like what my weekend is going to be ahead of me yeah as I'm unloading all these boxes and setting up my television. Um, so we're almost at the end of the hour, Dr. Mullen. I really want to thank you for spending, spending the time. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit over the past week as we've been talking, and especially today. I always like to ask, are, are there any parting words that you would like to leave our audience with, rem, re, you know, reminding you that many people are in the beginning of their journey, as we've, we've talked about today, and, and may not know the next step forward, which we always keep coming back to as well. Um, you seem to have a good grasp on what you're trying to accomplish. And to me, there seems to be a reason to be hopeful. But are there any parting words or things we may not have touched on today that you think are important for our audience to hear before we close out? Oh, I, th I think you've uh, given me a very fine opportunity to um, elaborate on the subject. Um, I think what I'd like to say to the patients, uh, and I, frankly spoken, the patient is far more important than anything, the net test included. The patient has to feel comfortable. Mm. Um, if you're a patient and you're worried about your disease, which I think is almost axiomatic, um, you want to know as much about it as possible. And here's a new source of information, which will on a moment to moment basis tell you how you and your disease are doing. Mm. It'll tell you whether the drugs you're getting, re receiving, the treatment you're receiving for your doctors is effective or not. And it will also corroborate for you if the images that you're being, uh, that are being looked at above your disease are giving as much information as possible or that the test corroborated. Um, it's most important about everything to know as much as possible as you can about your disease and its treatment. The NET test, simply offers to do that um it's it's um it's genesis genesis is as i've said at ren laboratories uh you can 
find that on the website very easily and um, it's available widely available if you want it and if you want some information about your disease um, I'm as you see pretty loquacious and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it and try to be helpful uh, my job is not to second guess any other physician it's just to give you a different perspective of the disease. So the message is find out as much as you can about your disease and embrace state-of-the-art uh, tools that are now being made available to the public. That would be my message. Absolutely. Absolutely. Use everything in that toolbox. And this seems to be quite an effective tool. So I hope that people were able to utilize it. Um, doc, I have one last caveat, please. if I may. Sure. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that I find all the part time when I talk to my colleagues, this is physicians, they say, we don't understand it, you know. And so, you know, the, the, the inference being, well, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to use it. But, you know, you don't have to. I mean, when you get on a jet plane to fly somewhere, uh, you don't have any idea how those turbos work. Um, when you switch on your computer and talk to somebody on voice activated internet protocols, you don't have any idea how that works, but you use it because it works for you. I urge you to use something that works for you. Don't worry too much as, as to whether you understand it or not. It's taken me 30 years to figure this out. Nobody's going to get it in a couple of months. Mm, great point. I love that to end on Dr. Monlin. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure having you and everyone there at home. If you have received some value today, like I have, send us a little thumbs up or a heart emoji down there at the bottom right hand uh, part of your screen. And again, if we weren't able to get you information that you need to, that will help you take that step forward on your journey, reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation either here on the Facebook page. You can send them a message or at carcinoid.org. This video will stay here on the Facebook page under the videos tab. It will also live on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation YouTube channel for those who don't have Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that we have helped you. Um, thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. Without them, this, this program wouldn't be possible at all. And please join us next time. We will be back next week with our next episode in luncheon with the experts. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Stay healthy. Stay safe.